So welcome everyone uh, to this week's learning space. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay and I'm and I'm going to mute Mike if he keeps moving. <laughs> okay. Those darn hardwood floors. Um, okay, and I, I sorry, Mike, I muted you. You'll need to unmute yourself at the upper right. Um, so, hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's learning space. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay, and with me is my co-host Georgia Bracy, as well as Mike Simons, who is the fearless leader of Astronomers Without Borders, and they are getting ready to start this month's Global Astronomy Month, and that's what we're going to be talking about during today's show. Um, just as a heads up, directly following this show at a different URL will be this week's My Moon, where we're going to jump from talking about uh, exploring the sky to exploring just the moon. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. Um, so let's just go ahead and get things started. Mike, you can unmute yourself. Um, <laughs> tell us about Global Astronomy Month. Well, first I have to do the one thing I, I have to do about half the time and correct you that my name is Simmons, not Simons. Oh. Uh, but but most a lot of people get that wrong. And so that's that's my pet peeve, but that's okay. And I like uh, to combine you with the, the awesome amateur astronomer Mike Simonson. I know you are two different humans, but you are both awesome, and I've apparently given, given you one collective name. I have been afraid uh, of making that mistake for the past two weeks, as this has we, been getting closer. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, His presence on, on Earth has really confused my life, and I've sometimes <laughs> had questions or things showing up at conferences saying, I thought you said you weren't going to make it. Um, so uh, we do cross paths that way. But in any event, the organization is Astronomers Without Borders uh, that I hope many of the viewers know about now. We've been around really not a very long time, but we've, uh, we've engaged uh, people all over the world in, in, in many different programs. And one of the things that we started a few years ago is Global Astronomy Month. Now, this is a follow-on to the 100 Hours of Astronomy Cornerstone Project in the International Year of Astronomy that, uh, <clears throat> that I co-chaired and led the uh, Global Star Party and other, most of the other events that took place. And it was just such an awesome thing with people basically getting together to do one big star party and one big event of other types that we just had to follow on with it. But at this point, it's grown. Uh, not only is there a month, so there's plenty of time for people to, uh, to do events even if they're they're weathered out and other things, but there are all kinds of things that I never imagined. Uh, one of the big things is uh, astronomy in the arts, uh, space art. Uh, this this year, for the first time, we're going to have some online uh, films uh, screenings, uh, basically a little uh, GAM mini film festival with panels, Q and A from some very interesting people that you ordinarily wouldn't get a chance to see. That, uh, with the generous help of CosmoQuest and uh, many other really innovative things that, that people, both within the astronomy community and on these sort of, what I always thought of as sort of secondary areas associated with astronomy, like artists and, uh, and others are, are doing. So there's quite a bit new going far beyond really anything that we've done before. Right. So, so for, uh, oh, go ahead, Pamela. So for any of you who have any questions for Mike, you can reach us either by leaving a comment on the Hangout, by leaving us a comment on the YouTube channel, or uh, if you're on Twitter, which I know is my favorite place to be, um, go ahead and use the hashtag learning space. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. So Georgia, what ask we're... us uh, questions, and we'll talk a little bit about um, how you can get involved. And in, so, with the Global Astronomy Month, um, it is next month, correct? Month That's of right. April. And um, but I know, and we, you've got lots of activities. I, we could. I was telling Pamela before we started, you could probably spend many, many episodes of this just talking about all the activities you have planned. Um, and maybe you want to start by telling people, you know, where they can find information um, to see all the different activities so they can take a look, see what they might want to, you know, line up for themselves as they plan their April. Right. Well, 
The, the GAM uh, Global Astronomy Month website is really a subsite of Astronomers Without Borders. So if you if you go to astronomerswithoutborders.org, it, it will it will be on there. But to go directly to that section, you can go to GAM G A M hyphen awb dot org that's the home page for everything and there are links there that go to the different kinds of programs there is a program schedule that's pr probably the first place to stop in and take a look with links to all the different types of programs and I will say that there are still programs in planning I think we have some 30 programs that are up there now but there are several more that are going to be published before long now the thing is that these are not necessarily Astronomers Without Borders programs, at least not by themselves. Most of the programs that we have, both in Global Astronomy Month and the rest of the year, are partner programs. They are things that people are doing that may be limited to one country, may not have reached a larger audience. Could be something very large uh, that NASA or somebody else does, uh, but they, they, for one reason or another, want to have this as a part of of this bigger event and uh, so we develop programs that are specific to it sometimes with the big programs that go on all year is a special contest or something like that that sort of highlights it during global astronomy month it's something we started uh, with hundred hours of astronomy uh, four years ago with uh, galaxy zoo and the Cassini uh, mission and, mm -hmm. and some others who just sort of wanted to get in on the action so it's really like a big tent where everybody comes in and it's a not a three ring circus, maybe a 30 ring circus. <laughs> and, and you can go around and, and, and see what's going on there right. and learn more about programs that happen all the time. Yep, excellent. Okay, great. Well, would you like to um, maybe pick one that you'd like to uh, tell everybody out about? Um, I don't know if you want to, you know, some of the first ones. I know there, some of them obviously have certain dates when they're kind of in operation or. Right participate throughout the month, so I know a couple sneak in actually at the end of March um, and begin, well, but um, yeah. otherwise, you know, maybe you could just pick one, you know, to kind of launch us off with here, one that, one well, that you'd like to highlight. One that sneaks in at the, at the end of March and, and then closes off the month as well with another short campaign is, is Globe at Night, and this is an example of a fantastic program that goes on all year. Uh, it has to do with making measurements of the night sky around the world. It's a small citizen science project in a way. You're, you're making measurements you're, uh, uh, in a couple of different ways. And there are special campaigns during Global Astronomy Month. Well, these have to be done according to the phase of the moon so that you have a good measurement. So they have a couple campaigns, one starting before April 1st, and then ending as the moon comes up, and then then the same thing at the end of the month. Uh, so that's a good partner program. Mm -hmm, right. Now, specific events on certain days, like the Global Star Party, to me has always been, you know, I'm, I'm the typical observer who just likes to put my eye up to an eyepiece all the time. <clears throat> and that's always been my favorite. And, of course, in the case of uh, Global Star Party now, as, as in... Uh, in IYA, it's mostly about public outreach, uh, people setting up and saying, you know, this is a part of a bigger event and using that as a way to, to draw more people in. And, uh, and CosmoQuest will be part of that with our virtual star parties. So, oh, cool. People who don't want to go outside, well, you should. But if it's cloudy, rainy, nasty, awful outside, uh, pop online and get your eyepiece view well with us. Exactly, and that's that's great too. Another thing I, I would want to mention that both closes, opens and closes the month is another online event that's similar but different, uh, or a series of events, a virtual telescope in Italy. Uh, our partner there runs a series of events where he uh, brings people into his own observatory with some professional class telescopes, and he's a professional astronomer. And he'll start off the month as he usually does doing a Messier marathon. So he'll be up all night getting as many Messier objects as he can. He'll be telling people what is going on. And you, it's like being in there with him. You can see his, uh, his desktop. Uh, there's a chat box to talk with each other. I'm waiting for an app that will share the coffee between, 
you know, thermoses of coffee, and then it'll be just like a regular star party. Right, I'm waiting for that app too. Yeah, yeah and so he's the only one who has to stay up all night, and he's a, uh, there getting as many objects as he can, and people come in from all over the world. And, mm. and you know, it's interesting with global events, it's, you got people talking to each other, and there may be friends or not, and they know each other by screen names, and sooner or later somebody says, so where is everybody from? And you start seeing countries that you know, you may not have any idea where they are. It, it just doesn't make any difference. You don't know until you ask. So that's really a, a fun one to me because there are tens of thousands of people uh, hanging out in, in this small observatory together throughout the night. And there, so there's a series of those throughout the month, but that's a big opening event there with the Messier Marathon. Okay, fun, fun, yeah. Uh, let's see. So um, obviously, this is a you know you try to get a worldwide component to to yeah. your that's that's part of your mission. Um, mm -hmm. There's another activity that I noticed that I thought maybe you could speak to because it was definitely um, international. Um, Thirty nights of star peace. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, that you know, is I don't know who I just I noticed that just jumped out at me when I was looking over the big list and so. Um, that seemed to be right in line with your mission, but um, I don't know if that's one, an activity that you guys actually do or if that's a partner. It's a combination. It's a combination. We, we've got hybrids of all kinds here. Uh, some things are our own program, some things are totally partner, and some things we work on together. And that's one of those. And that's one also that's got some initial information, but it's coming together at the last minute, and it will, because this has been done before. This is, exactly. star piece is it is a, you're exactly right. It is really the mission of Astronomers Without Borders. My mm -hmm. my idea in starting it was to use astronomy to bring people together. And the place where I started doing this internationally was Iran, a country mm -hmm. I've been to many times. I was just back there a couple months ago. And I, the astronomy community is huge. It's almost entirely young women as opposed to the uh, older males in my country here where we're located. Wow, that's exciting, yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's really vibrant, and I, I just love the people and the culture and everything. And when I came back here and gave uh, presentations about astronomy in Iran, it turned out to be more cultural awareness than it was mm -hmm. about astronomy because they're doing the same thing. They just have fewer resources and you know, other other difficulties, other differences. You know, weekends are on different days because it's a Muslim country. Uh -huh. But uh, this is a group of, of mostly students in Iran who started Star Peace. And the idea there is exactly the kind of thing I would have wanted to do myself if we'd gotten around to it, but it's just as well somebody else did it and made it happen, is to have star parties at country borders, such as uh, ones that have happened between India and Pakistan, where the astronomers come together and observe from across the border, and neither one could get closer than about 100 meters from the border, but they could see each other and they talk to each other on their cell phones. So that was the yeah. best they could do. Uh, <clears throat> 30 Nights of Star Peace is a way of doing this, just connecting people generally in the same slice uh, section of longitude so that it's about the same time and people have star parties and they can share with each other on Hangout like we're doing now on Skype. Uh, we have blogs, everybody that joins has a space for a blog on our website so it's a good place to put up reports on things like this and share with everybody else. So this is just exactly what I had in, in mind in the first place and I was just delighted it came up you know, with somebody else doing it. We're going to be sort of co-managing it because we're mostly students and they're busy with school and everything else, but sure. it's their idea and it's their program. Yeah. Now is the idea so clubs can get involved, right? Could this be individuals or um, astronomy clubs that would like to partner with somebody else, as you say, on the same, you know, longitude? Right. It's, line? it's really How meant for it, clubs. Yeah. It's much yeah. Clubs. Okay. yeah, it's really for clubs who are uh, doing their own observing and uh, or doing outreach. Mm -hmm. And the clubs get together and, you know, the fun thing is you get to know people in the other countries by doing something so familiar to all of you. You, you know, when you go to star parties sometimes, this has happened to all of us, that you, you'll meet people that during the night in the dark, 
that you really get along with and you spend the whole night observing and in the morning you don't know who anybody is anymore. You can't recognize anybody. You yeah. can't recognize them until they talk. Uh, <laughs> and and it's kind of like that in a way. You know, you, you, the people are, there they are, live on the camera on Skype or something mm -hmm. like that. But it, it's primarily meant for uh, clubs to do that. Now, as to how, mm -hmm. well, there are a few more things that have to go up on the website, and we'll have uh, ways that people can sign up and say we want to pair with somebody, and we'll provide a list of clubs that are available. Okay, okay, and that activity too, I think, as to when it happens depends on which well, longitude. Yes, exactly. The way this was the moment, correct. Yeah, the way this was worked out is to divide the world up into set ten segments, and there are three days then over the 30 for each one of these longitude segments and you're supposed to have your star party during that time so the first segment will be I forget which where it is and people will have their star parties then and then it'll move on to the next segment and those people will have their star parties so it's sort of like a a movable star party it is know, it's really it sounds so cool <laughs> it it's passed on yeah. from one to another yeah. as it one as it goes around the world around the globe yeah yeah that's an amazing activity. That it would be great, of course, if people can do them at borders, but the big countries like what we live in, not all of us live near enough a border. So, so, so we have a question from um, Guido Bibra. I'm, I'm not actually sure how to say this name. I'm so sorry. I'm sure I destroyed that. Um, and he's asking, do we have any connections in Germany? In general, is there a way that people can find out who might be in their country so they can better connect with them? Well, there are. We have, I think, we're going through a revamp of many of the things on our website right now. But we have, oh, I forget, 500, 700, something like that, affiliates. The affiliates are just groups. They're member groups rather than individuals. And uh, you can go on there, and under affiliates, you can search, see everybody, all the clubs that are there, or planetariums or others that belong to the community. Um, in your country and uh, find the ones that are nearest to you. Now we've got some upgrades as, as always upgrading websites to new tools it's extremely painful um, uh, as you know Pamela I think you can do more of that than any of us and uh, so, so we are making some changes now and that will be getting much easier and we'll have more ways for people to uh, to get involved and to find the other clubs. But we also have uh, national coordinators in, in uh, many different countries okay. and you can contact them for more information as well. And these are generally very active people in the astronomy community in their, in their home countries. Right, okay. So keep checking back to the website. And it's um, always changing, unfortunately. There, right. Okay, good. Um, all right, so maybe we can go. Um, what's another activity that you? Um, is there one that seems to be uh, more popular um, with the public than others, or seems to get a better um, participation rate, or does that? Is there no I, way to really engage that? Well, we we a lot. Of, with, with organizing everything that we've been doing and with the immense uh, popularity of things with partners and participants, we are behind in terms of the usual evaluation. I, I so it's hard to say for all of the programs, but uh, I would say the online observing is very popular. And of course, yeah. the observing programs, and, and there's, a, a, there's more of a slate of observing programs this time. And these are things that people may do themselves, but we hope that they'll share through their member blogs and, and, and other things as well. Um, there, there's a night focusing on Jupiter, a night focusing on Saturn, and we want to hear what people are doing and what people's reactions are to that on our site. Uh, there is, and, and this one's last minute, so it's, it's undergoing some refinement, shall we say, but a, a really awesome program of observing the moon throughout the month that I think from an observer standpoint is really great for people who never really spend a lot of time uh, focusing on the moon or uh, you know aren't used to showing it to the public. I mean the moon, it, it, most of us deep sky observers think of the moon as something to be avoided at all costs. And it's the, 
Right. Yeah, and it's the best thing out up there. So this is yeah. A so good talk a little more. Right, I noticed that too. So you have sort of a um, I don't know progressive sort of moon observing uh, schedule going on throughout the month, highlighting different things that are visible on the moon depending on you know when it is you're observing it. So you want to run through a few things that people can be looking for in the moon or on well, the moon as they go there, through the month. Yeah, there there are some challenging uh, objects described there, and some of them are easy binocular ones. I think one that, uh, and we'll have to see, um, this may go through some evolution, but one thing I really like, we've talked about a long time, is focusing on different phases of the moon. Mm -hmm. You know, some people really can't quite get it why this, the moon goes through phases, what's, what's happening. And it sort of guides you through, here's what's going on at this phase. Okay, this is the 15th day of the lunar cycle. Let's see what's going on then. And I think that's, that's really good. Um, so I, I think that could be an educational thing, too. And I think as that progresses and develops and we find out what really uh, people are really interested in, that may develop into an educational resource for classrooms and so on. Too. Sure, sure. Right, because as you said, the moon is very easy to observe. Um, don't need any special equipment, just need your eyes. And then as it goes through its phases, you know, it's, it's visible at different times in the day and night. And I know from my teaching perspective, you know, one of the first things that almost, you know, shocks people, they don't realize that you can see the moon during the day. Right. And for teachers, especially, who don't want to have to figure out how they're going to get their students together to go observe the moon, you know, at night after school, you know, you can take your class out during those times when the moon's visible during the day and go right out there and do some nice lunar observing, you know, during those school hours, right, during right. science class. So that's, that's a great thing to highlight. And, you know, people, once you tell them and they think about it and they think, yeah, you know, I have seen the moon during the day, but... When you first present them with that idea, you know, it just doesn't seem right. Right. <laughs> no, oh, yeah. Obviously, it's, it's a nighttime thing, but, but it's really, it's a neat way that, you know, one of the first things they kind of, you know, a surprise about the moon. That, right. They'll, you know, they'll see it. so familiar and old. <laughs> yeah. Right. They'll see it, uh, see it one day and say, well, uh, that's never happened before, but they've just never <laughs> noticed wrong? it before. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think that's well, a great that's a great project, yeah. Yeah, and it's you know, we had a teacher once who wanted to do a project that, that didn't quite come off. We did a little bit of it, but we didn't have the resources to help her out with it. Which this I I, I thought of this when it was presented to us to uh, follow up to have people take pictures of the moon from all around the world mm -hmm. at the same time or on the same night, because a lot of people don't realize that the moon looks the same no matter where you are. It, if, if you go to the other side of the earth, you don't, the crescent doesn't become a, an almost full moon. Yeah. So there are a lot of things that can be done with that that, that we're working on. It's just a matter of getting yeah, going. Fantastic. Right, and so the idea that, you know, people are around the globe at different times and, and sometimes at the same time doing these different astronomy activities is great, but then the sharing part is, is another important, no matter if you're doing something, you know, on your own with your telescope or camera or just looking, um, or if you're with an astronomy club, um, it's not just doing that, but then uh, blogging about it, uploading it to the website. I know, I think you have some different options for people to share, you know, whatever it is they're doing. So maybe right. you could, yeah, talk about all the different ways you're hoping people are going to connect with each other and share what they're doing. Well, the main thing is, of course, that m most people use Facebook for posting all of their things, and we were sort of moving towards that because Facebook sort of took over the entire online world. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're kind of moving back from that. We have a new um, component now to make blogging easier for all of the members because Facebook, things get lost. I mean, there's just yeah. too much. Yeah. and audiences, there are a billion people using Facebook, but on our site people like to post there uh, because they can make one cohesive blog, it's not as restrictive as Facebook, but also the audience there is the audience you, you want. This is fellow astronomers and, and other organizations. So uh, again, it's one thing that's being updated and just starting to be used now, and that's what we really want to use during the month, to have uh, people using that blog as much as possible. You can put in your pictures and 
and share things and uh, tag it, uh, put in what country it is, and we'll feature some of them. And you know, when people see, oh, this is what's going on in this country, they'll take a look at it. So you get uh, get more attention that way. Mm -hmm. I think the people you want to see it anyway. Sure. And to do a blog, um, you have to get an account. Um, right. Astronomers Without Borders, right? You want to right, and that's just a. Yeah, it's just simple registration. You okay. sign up and give give little little information about yourself, and uh, we don't sell our list to anybody, obviously. Mm -hmm. But uh, you get uh, the the mailings, all the updates on programs and things as well, and uh, so that's very easy. I'd like to mention that uh, there are different ways of signing up, and the the one I want to mention the most is the ones that are supporting memberships. These are people who pay something for the membership. People often say, why do you have a free membership? You, you can raise a lot of money. The problem is that most of the world could not afford to pay anything for a membership. And it would be counterproductive for us to, to knock people out from all over the world because they can. In fact, even if they had the money, much of the world has no way to pay anything online anyway. Yeah. So <clears throat> there's always going to be free membership. And there are paying memberships, supporting memberships as well, which we uh, hope that we get more people doing to help support what we're doing for the sake of everybody all around the world. And you can just donate on the website, I think. Is that right or no? Oh, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you want, uh, if you can, you can donate directly. You can um, write to me if you if you want to know, you know, how you can transfer a million dollars. It will, we, we don't turn anyone away in that regard. No. There's, <laughs> there's something else I'll mention. because We'll push it during Global Astronomy, and it's, it's not related to the program, but since we're talking about trying to, to raise funds, which I know you guys are sympathetic to with, uh, with all you do as well, uh, we have an online store. It's uh, simply shop.astronomerswithoutborders.org, and there's some real bargains there of uh, things that have been donated by manufacturers to support us. They're... Uh, supporters who have given us really tens of thousands of dollars worth of merchandise which is available there and because these are donations we get 100 percent of it so there are some uh, ED refractors from Celestron, uh, uh, Lunt Solar Telescope and a couple other good ones, um, Teleview eyepieces, some good stuff so if anybody out there needs a little bit more astronomy swag of a high level kind, it's a place to go. Excellent. That's very good to know. Okay. And we have Teal uh, Bristra pointing out over on the event page that during National Science Week, uh, his team did daylight astronomy with Venus, Jupiter, the Moon, and solar viewing. People were really spun out. So this this should serve as an inspiration for all of you who are still planning your activities for during Global Astronomy Month. And if you need your sunglass, your solar glasses, I know solar glasses are one of those things that Astronomers Without Borders always stocks. Yes, we have those as well. And there are solar eclipses coming up uh, this year in a couple of places around the world. The the solar this the, uh, daytime stuff is is really great. And I used to do that too at a public observatory I worked at many years ago, showing Venus to people in a in a big telescope. And uh, we do have a Sunday, which is also a carryover from hundred hours of astronomy, mm -hmm. which is very popular when when we focus on the sun for those people who have all the safety features required and what they're doing. Excellent. Excellent. And then um, I'll just run through a couple others here that are leaping out at me. Um, so Yuri's Night is also during April, and that's one that we, CosmoQuest, tries to jump in on um, every year. That's a great, that's a great event. Um, can you right. tell us anything about, anything special about um, what well, you Well, yeah, we don't have any. With that one? Yeah, we don't have anything uh, special with Yuri's Night other than to say this is going on. It's going on during the month, and and we we just give a big shout out to it. I've known the the people who started that for for many many years, and it's a it's a great thing that's celebrated. Uh, I think in more in other countries than it is in the U.S. Um, so it's uh, it's just a, a good thing that's happening uh, during that time. And I can tell you, they haven't all been announced yet, but there is going to be a really awesome film and uh, panel 
uh, uh, I guess there's no reason not to say, but we're planning on showing the movie Overview, uh, which has gotten a million views on Vimeo f by people who have, have seen it uh, mentioned on various blogs and things, but hasn't reached uh, much of the astronomy crowd yet. And the, uh, the author of uh, The Overview Effect, uh, whose, whose uh, institute has created this film, along with a few astronauts who are featured in the film and, and were on the uh, International Space Station. That's going to be a really interesting discussion as well. And that happens on Yuri's night, so that's the plan. Mm, that sounds excellent. Very good. Okay. Um, and then you also, so you have Twitter, um, just really quick going back to sharing things. Mm -hmm. There's also, um, you have def couple different Twitter. Um, you have Twitter for Astronomers Without Borders and also for Global Astronomy Month. Right, um, right. The actual hashtag or um, Twitter is escaping me at the moment, but again, I know those are on your website, but those are other ways to share. Sure, well. sure. And, and of course, to get the, uh, the feeds for um, what we're doing and a Facebook page for for um, Astronomers Without Borders, the Twitter feed is, uh, the hashtag is AWB underscore ORG. And I think it's, I can't remember the GAM one. <laughs> so I think it's. <laughs> we can uh, find that. That's okay. I can't yeah, remember. I saw yeah. it just earlier today. And so CAM something. <laughs> yeah, the GAM is in there. I know that. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure someone will have it up in the comments any second now. Uh, one thing, I we have a really interesting thought coming in from Sylvan Westby. He, he says, why is it that watching the stars serves as a vessel for science outreach so well in many cases? Because it unites people or are they, especially children, generally more curious about stars than about other comparable science stuff? Wow, so that that's really a great comment question combined. It's a yeah. great topic, I think, because because some of the answer to that is clear, and some of it is kind of mysterious. You know, why does it serve this way? One of the things about Astronomers Without Borders, for example, it serves as a way to connect people in different countries that really does transcend politics. And so, and and why does it do that? Well. I think one of the reasons is the huge interest in astronomy. I, to me, it's more than just an interest. It's hard to find anybody that doesn't have some real sense of awe and wonder about what is out there when they see it on the Discover Channel or something else. And those children who express this awe and interest in astronomy, in my experience doing public outreach for 40 years, years or something, uh, it doesn't go away. It, it just, there are other things that, that seem to uh, take over. You know, in my case, I, I was one of those absolutely enthralled kids who then got onto other things and then when I was a young adult rediscovered astronomy. It just never went away. So some of us managed to, you know, we have a Peter Pan complex or something and so we don't grow up. And but. When you are dealing with uh, adults who seem very adult and authoritative and everything else, and you show them a view of Saturn in the telescope, they turn into eight-year-olds again. Yeah, it's uh, awesome. It is. It's unbelievable. And so now, as far as, as the way it works to connect people, you know, there just aren't that many amateur nuclear physicists or or... Are, I think are, that's slightly illegal. Well, it's yeah, it's <laughs> probably. Good. I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> there are too many amateurs. Or, or amateur. Uh, right. You know, there are good connections in a lot of different sciences that have some amateurs. You know, more amateurs, things that are more accessible, like, uh, like in various fields of botany or something like yeah. that. And there's a lot of sharing there. But the difference with astronomy is, first of all, it's accessible to everybody, no matter where they are. Mm -hmm. And it's something that has, uh, as far as I can tell, a more universal interest. I think of it as being genetic. I mean, it, it, it's as though we are born with a gene that says, thou shalt love astronomy. Yeah. Uh, there isn't anybody that isn't fascinated by the, the questions about where are we and 
what's going on around us. The, the, the rest of the universe is not someplace else. That's our neighborhood. And so it seems natural. And, and so it's just so universal that it, it, it makes sense. And it's so basic. Mm -hmm. Right. It really does touch something that everybody has as a human being. Yeah. The, the intrinsic questions of where where did we come from, where are we going, how does it all end? Astronomy works to address all of those. It does, and, and there's there's something for everyone, so to speak. And I have to say that I haven't found a country yet that doesn't have some astronomers in it. I have uh, heard of or talked to amateur astronomers who thought they were the only ones in their country. And I was able to say, no, you're not, because I know a couple others. And I know there are more but they're not in touch with each other. But mm -hmm. when they are, it's yeah. a connection that doesn't have anything to do with all that other stuff. I mean, here, here's this question to throw back at you that I find interesting. You know, Pamela, I know you and I will stand up in front of a big crowd and say, astronomy is the oldest science, and people looked up at the stars in awe and wonder for hundreds of thousands of years. And the question is, how do we know that? You know, we don't even question it. We're both scientists, and we're just throwing this thing out there. Where there's no evidence. For, well, there's evidence going yeah. back a few thousand years. But, you know, it's just sort of like saying people 100,000 years ago experienced gravity. You know it. And that's kind of says something about how universal it seems to be. Yeah. And, and I think we do rely, because we are, actu after all, evidence-based creatures, uh, we do rely on artwork, cave drawings, everything else that we find that indicates these people were uh, discovering supernovae, were watching the comets, were fascinated and terrified and inspired all at the same time by these events that they were experiencing. Oh, well, that's true, too. But <laughs> the people who weren't drawing paintings on the cave walls were also doing the same thing. I mean, we just, you know, it's a pretty good assumption. I, I, I feel yeah. I, I spent my life in, in publishing research papers, you know, and I'm pretty comfortable making that statement. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Well, I think it really, I mean, those statements ring true with most people as well. There's just something that seems to make sense about that. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, way back, the people that lived long ago before all the, the city lights and pollution, you know, they were perhaps more connected um, and more in tune with uh, the outside world and the sky in general than, than a lot of people are today. So um, it's, right. I think there's that part of it, too. I, and you know, here's another thing that, sorry, uh, oh, here's great. another thing that speaks to that, and I, I think is is the reason for popularity of one type of program that I never expected in Global Astronomy Month, which is that astronomy is in every culture. You know, you look back through time, uh, or you look across through all the different cultures. There's something there all the time. You may not even be aware of it. And uh, we've had various attempts at starting some cultural astronomy things, uniting people to uh, to make a little bit more of that and have a sort of central uh, repository of information, which we're working on. But the astronomy and the arts programs, I think, largely have to do with that because their astronomy is part of our expression of culture, including art and other things, and that's been used hugely popular. Uh, our astro poetry blog has turned out to be a big winner. Mm -hmm. That was not my idea, I have to say. <laughs> it's a great program that a lot of of people have have really latched onto. And what's been neat is uh, listening to people in other fields talk about how they've been inspired to take what you're doing with that and and promote it elsewhere. Yeah, so is that so. related to? Um, I see there's an astro poetry contest. That's right. Yeah. So you want. Tell we us did a that. About that. Yeah, we did that last year, and and we're going to repeat it now because there were, I don't know, some seventy something entries from seventeen countries or something. And this is one of the things that you find. I, I just find these all the time. And they're fascinating. Romania seems to be a hotbed of astro poetry. Hmm. Who, who'd have thought? That's kind you know, of awesome. It, it is. You just have, you have no idea what you're kind of going to find, but they are. And so. You know, that's something that anybody can enter, and there are different uh, age levels and so on. Okay, um, great. And that, that also, there have been uh, entries and winners from uh, classes 
Another one, you know, there are some educational things. We're not really an education organization, though we are have some upcoming programs outside of GAM that we'll be partnering with some education um, uh, organizations. But uh, one that's that's cool for classrooms, for example, is the International Asteroid Search uh, Collaboration. That is a year-long program that's led by a professional astronomer here in the United States, and he gets uh, photographic uh, images from telescopes, survey telescopes, and they are sent around to classrooms who then comb through them for signs of moving objects and determine whether or not there might have been asteroids in them. They sometimes discover one, and when they do, of course, it's a big deal. Now, there is a special GAM campaign that he set up that will happen during GAM. We've recruited classrooms through our website, and if anybody wants to, to have their classroom take part in that, the information is there and the uh, the form or contact information for applying for that. And this is not only fun, and you can imagine the excitement for classrooms when they find something, but there was recently an inauguration of an, a new very nice observatory at a school in Nicaragua as a result of their taking part in this. The right. students at this school found an asteroid, and this was national news in Nicaragua. And I think they were saying this is the first one ever discovered by Nicaraguans, which may or may not have been true. And it attracted so much attention that they got donations to build the observatory on their school grounds that they'd always been wanting to do. And so that was just done and attended by the vice president of the, company, the country and and the mayor of Managua and so on. And this is the kind of thing that happens sometimes. It's one of the things about Astronomers Without Borders that is the most satisfying is that these things can have a huge impact in many places beyond what we would expect. But anyway, that's another, it's an educational program and, and during Global Astronomy Month it's happening again this year. And uh, uh, What age students, uh, Mike, would you... Not all of them have a, a huge uh, sharing component, but we can always make that happen too. There's just, sure, I got to say, yeah. This, yeah, there's just sharing more. Happen. Yeah, there's just yeah. more than we can really manage. Uh, it, it's, it's grown bigger than, faster than we have. So. Um, yeah, all starting with 100 hours. Huh? Yeah, well. How many it's, hours are there in the month? What have you. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I started uh, and then figure out. Yeah. Yeah, I started astronomers without borders before the International Year of Astronomy, and then had to set it aside when I got tapped for that. But uh, that was a big boost to astronomy worldwide and the types okay. of things that we're doing. So that's very important. Yeah, wonderful. Anything so, else? Oh, go ahead, Pamela. Sorry. I I was about I'll to say the same thing. We're going to need to tie this up because we're about to start the My Moon Hangout. Um, I, I'd like to, to thank those who are giving in the comments. Yes, uh, Guido, I don't know how to say your name. There are lots of astronomers who are musicians. Um, oh, yeah. we, we will yeah. be posting this on the 365 Days of Astronomy podcast, which is part of Astrosphere New Media, and the full video will appear on Astrosphere Vids. Um, stay tuned uh, on Google+. Plus. Go to the My Moon. Uh, page. We will be starting the My Moon Hangout in 10 minutes. And I'm going to ask Mike, do you have any closing statements that you'd like to, to share? 
Oh, not really. I've been talking <laughs> continuously for 45 minutes. What more could I say? Just check out the website is all. And if you have any comments, uh, yeah, please do write to us with any comments. Uh, donations are, are always very welcome. Uh, this, it's, we're, we're way behind on fundraising, just like every other nonprofit. But uh, main thing is just to go there, be aware, take part. And, and one interesting way you can help both of our organizations is we have a Amazon wish list where we're working to collect video cameras to send out all around the world. These, these are webcams that will allow more virtual star parties and allow classrooms to connect together for uh, Cafe Scientifics where instead of the scientist coming locally to a nation that may not have the scientist, there's only one astronomer in Sri Lanka. Well, we're going to send out cameras so that we can web together kids all over the world with scientists for a shared experience. So that's one way you can donate to both of our organizations on a joint project. That's awesome. Yeah, it's amazing how technology has just allowed this to just blossom and even explode. I don't, it's, it's amazing. Explode, yeah. Yeah. All right, great. Well, with that, I think uh, we want to thank you very much, Mike, for um, agreeing to come and talk with us. It's been a lot of fun, a whole lot it's been of fun. a delight. Thank you. I'm looking forward to April well, <laughs> for more than one reason, but especially for this. So thank you. Okay. So much. Okay. Thank you, guys. <laughs>